The first ever climate expedition to the South Pole from Singapore just happened between the 17th to the 26th of February. Uh, it was to study rising sea levels, the melting of the ice there, which, as we have learned from previous uh, discussions with our guest, uh, upcoming guest, Ben Horton, um, we are at greater risk here at the middle latitudes yep. at the equator than um, people at the higher or lower uh, latitudes. Let's let's bring on Professor Ben Horton now, the director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore, and also Christine Amor Lavar, the founder and CEO of Her Planet Earth and Women on a Mission. Uh, we're going to bring them both on to talk about uh, their trip to Antarctica. They're back in Singapore now, and uh, and and how that all went. Uh, fascinating. Ben, great to see you. Christine, great to see you as well. Uh, ben, let's start with you back on uh, on terra firma here in Singapore. How did the expedition go? Uh, the expedition went really, really well. Um, I mean, it started off with a variety of difficulties. We lost our luggage, which oh. if, you, if, oh, you no. travel, if you're traveling from Singapore in Singapore outfits, and then you land in um, the southern tip of Chile without any of your equipment. Oh my gosh! And any of your travel clothes. So that was a bit of a bit of a a bit of an emergency. But we sorted it out about six hours before we flew um, to a Chilean military base, which is on one of the islands uh, <laughs> northwest of the Antarctic Peninsula. So it started off, but I mean, it was um, it was. The trip couldn't have gone any better. I mean, when we were on the boat doing all our, you know, trying to make this documentary film, doing all our science, it was a bit full on. It was like nonstop from the moment you woke up at about 7 a.m. to the moment you went to sleep at about 10 or 11 p.m. So you didn't have much time to think about what you were actually doing. But I've now been in Singapore for nearly two weeks now, and it really has started to hit home that that was a trip that really did changed my life. Wow. Christine, let's, let's bring you in. Um, cause you were, you were kind of overseeing, uh, d different elements of the expedition. Tell us exactly what you were doing, um, uh, during, uh, you know, during the expedition and most importantly, were you responsible for the luggage being missing? I mean, come on, let's be honest. <laughs> I have to say that I didn't lose my luggage. So <laughs> but thanks for having me on the show, Glenn and Neil. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah, um, sure. You know, this was, as Ben said, it was a wonderful um, uh, trip and expedition. It was my second time actually in Antarctica, but this was the first time I got to travel with a group of brilliant scientists uh, and mm. for science because they were conducting research and obviously we were filming at documentary has been mentioned to raise awareness of what's happening in Antarctica and how it impacts us all in Asia Pacific and spe specifically you know a lot of people think that what happens so far away doesn't impact us but it really does um, so I didn't lose my luggage which was good um, I had air tags on as well so Ben don't forget <laughs> that next time but um, I helped basically my role was really to help uh, organize the trip because I do have a bit of experience organizing these expeditions as you probably know Glenn um, yeah. over the last 10 years mostly traveling with women so this time our team was obviously not just women um, but uh, you know worked with Quark Expeditions to, to make sure that um, our trip was booked and everybody was ready with equipment etc. Um, but it was a very productive trip, um, and uh, we can't wait to share the documentary with you in a few months. Yeah, yeah, Ben, you said it changed your life, and you came on our show a few weeks back from the Antarctica, and we're very grateful for that because we know how busy you were. How did it change your life in terms of, was it better or worse? Are you more optimistic or pessimistic? What are your sort of initial findings now that you've had a couple of weeks to digest it? It brought the reality of climate change very home to me and made the aspects of my research that I do be science or communication more urgent. Uh, I mean, I've been studying sea level rise for 30 years of my life, you know, beginning as a, you know, in my mid twenties as a PhD student, <clears throat> learning all the techniques that I could do to try and understand how sea level would change, how it changes in the future, the present or the past how it's different in England than it is in the US than it is in Singapore. I then have gone along a journey of looking at different coastlines and the impact of a melting ice sheet on them, be that in the developing world or the developed world. <clears throat> but when I went to Antarctica, I was actually able to see the processes at first hand and the scale was what changed my life. 
I mean, I, I've been to, you know, I've been to Svalbard, I've been to the Arctic, I've been to colossal mountain ranges, but the scale of Antarctica, it, it, it just absolutely blew my mind. And the amount of ice. So people talk about these numbers about, well, you know, Antarctica holds 60 meters of sea level rise, or if we melt the, th if we melt the Thwaites Glacier, it can destabilize three meters. That's a colossal amount of water because mm -hmm. you're thinking about all the oceans on the planet that you're going to raise by. The and I just thought, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's sort of like I was hope. And, but then when you see it, it's just mm -hmm. so big. It's so intimidating and it's so beautiful. Ben, um, when you look at the, uh, I, I know you have, probably haven't gotten much time to go through your core samples and the, and the various things. The question, I guess, that always comes up for many people uh, is, so we've gone through these cycles before, we've gone through the melt, we've gone through the freeze, et cetera. Are you getting any sense of, of how that has played out in Antarctica based on either your, your research or, uh, or the research that's been done uh, before you? Um, when was our last big melt? When, you know, what kind of impact did it have? What, what does the cycle look like? Um, and, and from previous conversations we've had, you know, the cycle is being accelerated uh, from, from what I can remember you telling us. But what, what, are you, what are you feeling or seeing right now from a scientific standpoint? Well, Antarctica is the existential threat to all coastal and other low-lying nations, and that's because it has so much water within it. Okay, so it has more than 60 meters of sea level rise. So if you think about Singapore, Singapore's got about a third of its island, which is only one meter above the highest tides. You only need to melt a small percentage of Antarctica to flood Singapore. Why it's an existential crisis is because then Singapore doesn't exist. Yeah. The problem with, uh, with Antarctica is that it's very, very hard to measure. You only have satellite-based measurements really starting in the 1990s, and scientific missions like ourselves are only snapshots. We can only go in the summer. I mean, when we were there, um, one day was beautiful and sunny. I mean, and I think the temperature was around 12 degrees C. And you mm. could see right in front of you the ice melting. We've got this, and we went to the front of an ice sheet, and the biggest danger was it collapsing on our heads. The yeah. zodiacs couldn't get any closer because the ice sheets were just disintegrating right in front of our eyes. Mm. Two days later, a storm came in that was so severe that we couldn't get off our big boat onto the zodiacs. We had blizzard conditions which shot the runways to get us out of Antarctica. So it's a very, very hostile environment. So it's very, it's an incredibly important environment to monitor, but we have significant difficulties monitoring. And that's why we went there. We went there to begin Singapore's first ever scientific investigation. And then we want to try and wait, raise the awareness because for Singapore, it needs to be aware of this threat, like it's aware of all other types. So you're just talking about, just before I came online, you're talking about the financial crisis and the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the big banks in Singapore are aware and are resilient to these changes in the world market. Singapore is not aware and it is not resilient to Antarctica. So that's why getting someone like Christine to help us is really important because the biggest message, we're only contributing a small amount to the global effort of science, but our biggest point is to cr create the message that we need to understand Antarctica to make Singapore and countries around us more resilient to change. Mm. Well, on that point, Christine, you know, you've devoted much of your time, energy and resources to this very issue. You've supported this expedition among many. What do you think both yourself, your organization, but Singapore generally and Singaporeans should be doing now based upon the research that people like Professor Horton is bringing together? It's a great question, Neil, and there's so much that we can do. I mean, obviously, uh, the last 10 years, my work has focused on supporting vulnerable women in particular because actually they are the most impacted by climate change, especially in our region, because they hold the majority of the agricultural roles. So that obviously will continue. And I work through um, charity organizations to fund programs in agricultural and wildlife conservation. But in Singapore, I mean, Singapore has, has a very unique position. As Ben said, you know, they are, um, you know, they are a financial center, but they are also very much at risk of sea level 
will rise. So the awareness has to increase. That's number one. And the capital that has to move very, very quickly because we don't have much time towards innovative solutions. So even though we are already looking at things like engineering to protect Singapore, seawalls, etc., we have some of the best in the world, but that's not going to be enough, right? So mm. that is just going to be a temporary solution because as soon as, it, as the sea level rises beyond even a few centimeters or even a meter, that is catastrophic for us. So I think a lot of capital and, and attention and focus needs to go on supporting innovative solution and some of it will come through technology some of it will have to be across different sectors of the economy through food tech so actually one of the clients i was working with during the pandemic is also looking at solutions and producing um, cellular agriculture uh, here in singapore so there are many ways that we can invest our time and energy and money to find solutions as fast as possible to try to impact the emissions that we have um, but, you know, for Singapore, it is really an existential threat um, that is that unfortunately very few people yeah. are still aware of. You know, I, I often get frustrated um, because, look, all of us live in Singapore. All of us know that many efforts have been put forward to uh, help people be conscious of our environment here, whether it's recycling or or doing less or what, whatever it is. And yet at the bottom, you know, at the end of the day, even though Singapore is quite a small country and adds very little in terms of global uh, climate change, we still... Uh, we still haven't done enough. And, you know, we look at the amount of, uh, of energy we use for air conditioning and, and other, you know, creature comforts, for example, and how that adds to the power plants that are, that are also adding to, to, uh, you know, to, to climate change and gases. We look at, at the oil refining that's happening here in Singapore and then just across the border in Malaysia as well. And, you know, massive contributors um, to, bad things that are going to happen to Singapore eventually. How do we make those changes when some of those things are so ingrained into our economy um, and, and things that, frankly, a lot of people don't want to give up? And Ben, I know this is a, a, a topic that you have thought about and talked about a lot, but uh, does it take on new importance now that you've been to Antarctica? Well, as I sort of started this conversation, my trip to Antarctica renewed my urgency about climate change. I think climate science is ever going to improve. I mean, there's more and more money being injected in by a variety of research organizations to try and understand the timing of these threats and in particular tipping points. That's the most important thing that the scientific community are trying to think about is mm -hmm. where is the threshold at which there is a point of no return? And just mm -hmm. to make sure that we have this evidence and we communicate this evidence to the policymakers and to the business communities. But climate is a aspect in everybody's life. The important thing is, is that we try to understand the impacts of climate change on the financial sector, the impacts on the health yeah. sector, the impacts on biodiversity. We then monitor these through innovations that we have in space-based technology, through AI. We then importantly communicate this and work with stakeholders. We have communication specialists because the norm for a scientist is that we write a report and we expect people to follow scientific advice. But this has not happened. I mean, the scientific community have been talking about the problems of climate change really since 1990. So 30 years later, we've not really moved that much further forward. There have been advancements in technology, particularly in renewables. But governments and policymakers have not moved the needle far enough. And I wouldn't single Singapore out on it on anything else. Singapore, perhaps in the last five years, has made more changes than virtually every other developed country. It's gone from nowhere to being one of the leading lights in COP27. It's now got governmental ministers considering climate change and sustainability at every level. You know, we can just, if you pick up the newspaper this week, when you go past the financial crisis, what did the Biden administration do? The Biden administration brought in the biggest climate legislation ever but then also opened up the Arctic to drilling. Yeah. And the scientific community have clearly stated that mm. the oil that we've discovered and already are tapping, if we tap all of that, we cross these thresholds and we have a catastrophe. Mm. So why in the world do we want to explore for more oil? It makes like zero scientific sense, zero. 
And I mm -hmm. just am just like, the, the, the power of these oil companies staggers me. You know, we had such successes in COP26 and before that, and there was the movement everywhere. But then you have last year, the oil companies making huge amounts of money. And then BP, we don't get this commercial in the US, in, in Singapore, but in the US, BP's big commercial is about developing energy from algae. It was their big sustainability banner. They closed yeah. them there because they make more money out of petroleum. So we seriously, as policymakers and individuals, business leaders, really need to think about climate change in every aspect. I mean, I don't know, I could list off some facts about Antarctica, which are unbelievably scary. You know, we went from, in 1990, Antarctic ice sheet contributing to the oceans about 100 gigatons of ice. That's quadrupled by 2020 to 400 gigatons. What's a gigaton? A gigaton is a billion tons. What's a gigaton? Well, if you think of it in terms of ice, everyone knows Central Park. One gigaton would fill the whole of Central Park to a height of around 400 meters of ice. <laughs> One gigaton fills 400,000, 400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's huge, and we're just contributing, and it's it's accelerating. We desperately mm. need to slow it down because if we can slow it down, I mean, the scientific community is not talking about a complete change in your life. It's incremental. The scientific mm. community has said by 2030 we need to peak emissions. That's possible. We have all the technology. We need to slow mm. down the road because then young scientists, young scientists can provide the answers to our generation and for their generation. It's very obvious. I mean, I work in the Earth Observatory of Singapore, and we've got all these young scientists. You know, I'm sure Christine can talk about all the innovation and minds that she meets in her various expeditions. But mm. I know at EOS that I've got these young scientists, and they're the most gifted scientists that have ever existed on planet Earth. We are in a very unfortunate time. We've got this problem. And we have the young people who can solve it. We just need the people in power and in place in policy to just slow down the rate of change. Mm. That, that's what I want to talk about. We'll get to that. We're talking to Ben Horton, director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore, and of course, Christine Amar Lavar, the founder and CEO of Her Planet Earth and Women on a Mission. Christine, I want to focus on that for a moment because Professor, Professor Horton comes on our show a lot and talks about what needs to be done, talks about the problems we face. But I come back to this almost existential resignation. You ask the average person on the street, yeah, it's bad, but I love my sushi. Yeah, it's bad, but I love my steak. Yeah, it's bad, but I love my car. And you end up pulling your hair out. Most people, I would argue, know the problems at this point, most people. And yet the resistance to change is still there. On an individual level, Christine, how do we change that? Well, I get asked this question a lot, and I also um, do talks to schools, you know, and of course, you know, when we look at the bigger pictures and we look at the, the, the ones who are the culprits for all the emissions, it's actually just about 90, 90 big companies around the world. And yet, us individually, we also have a role to play, right? So, of course, I tell them you have to become a, a climate activist, and, and all of us should in our own, in our own uh, you know, families, in our own communities, in our own schools, etc., so it's, it's uh, you know, from, from young people to uh, people all the way up into governments, we almost all of us need to be activists in the sense that we need to look at how we're spending our money, um, how we're investing with our banks and with their diff which companies we're working for. So all these things count. And even kids tell me, I'll take a shorter shower. I'll try to do this. I often tell them, you know, when you look at a person's emissions over one year, it's equivalent to uh, about eight, um, the size of eight um, black and white houses. So if you are a bit more conscientious in turning off the lights and, and you know, trying to be careful with uh, how much you use electricity, you can reduce it by one house, right? So the kids can understand that. So, of course, these things count. But I think the biggest problems are we need to tackle, our, as Ben said, you know, the big oil companies, the big corporations that are responsible for uh, all these emissions. And a lot of times we talk about um, carbon footprint and offsetting. And as, 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 as good as it is, it is only a fraction of what needs to be done. And actually, the responsibility has been shifted to individuals when, in fact, it is the bigger 
culprits, the big companies that need to change their whole product cycle and stop drilling in mm. places where they shouldn't be drilling. And so all of us collectively have a power to become those advocates and those activists. Uh, and we're seeing the youth doing it, people like Greta Thunberg and a lot of young people uh, in, around the world, uh, young women as well, you know, advocating for that, pushing and, and calling for big corporations and governments to take more responsibility because we are at a time crunch at the moment. And so, of course, it's a collective effort that is needed, but we need big brushstroke, big actions, big policies to change. And, and we can put pressure on our governments and on our companies. We can vote with our wallets, but we can also be vocal about it. We need to talk about it. Last week, it was International Women's Day week, you know, and I had a lot of uh, keynotes. And the first thing I started with was my trip to Antarctica. I wanted to bring awareness about why, why we went there and what's, what's happening there and the impacts it has, you know. So every platform that every single one of us has, you guys are on the radio, you know, every opportunity you have a chance to talk about the, the, the issues and what needs to be done, these will are incremental changes that have ripple effects of positivity and help move the needle. So I think every one of us should not feel powerless. We, can, we mm -hmm. all have power to, in actions, you know, that can help. Uh, find solutions and support young scientists or, or people with innovative solutions. I try to do that too as a consultant. I work with a, quite a few impact investors and funds now trying to scale up climate solutions. So this is my own climate action along with some of the issues I try to support through my charitable work. Um, but all of us can find a way to, to try to support those initiatives. Yeah, wonderful. Just can to I, add to that, Professor Horton. I, yeah, go on, go on. Um, you say about an existential you know, crisis and the lack of hope, then you listen to Christine. Hmm. No, there's no and lack then, of hope when it comes to young and then, people. And then you see that there is this pathway. I mean, Christine said something to me in Antarctica, which not really thought about, that everyone should be a climate activist in their own way. Yeah. That doesn't mean demonstrating on the streets, if that isn't what you want to do, but you do it in your own life. And I thought, yeah, that's what we need. We need every single person on planet Earth there are 8 billion of these, right? 8 billion become climate activists. We solved the problem. The, big, the, big, the, 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 the issue to do with that is education and knowledge. Once you know about this problem, it's quite easy to go, right, oh, I need to do something about this. You know, I need to not drive my car today, or I will have vegetarian today, or what have you, whatever. You know, I'm going to make sure I switch my plugs off. I'm going to change my thermostat from you know, 24 mm -hmm. to 26. But if you don't know about it, why would you do it? If you don't think it's going to be a problem for your kids or the people you love, why would you do that? I mean, I mean, obviously, one of the biggest draws you always pull on people is that most people um, are parents or guardians or certainly have a loved one that's in the younger generation. And it's your action. So, you know, as a parent, what, what, what's your number one priority? It's to make sure that your children are healthy and happy. Climate change will make sure that does not happen. And so if you're informed of that, and then you're given some things that you can do individually, then it's great. And then, you know, Christine's role, Christine's role because she speaks to different types of communities. I mainly speak to a mirror. I speak to other scientists, you know, because we want to get the latest information, spend a lot of time talking to other scientists. But a big thing I've tried to do is, that, I mean, I was at the China ASEAN um, Business Forum at Raffles uh, last week, and I spoke. And... That was like illuminating because we had a variety of investors who were trying to invest in nature-based solutions. We had people talking about investments, for example, in the new capital in Indonesia, and then you have a climate scientist. And I was invited in and I, I gave them some really, I don't know, I, I went up there and I just gave it from the heart. And I, I basically said, for example, the new investment at the capital in Indonesia, has the environmental risk been taken into account? It's a bad investment unless they know what the environmental risk is. Do they know what the water available? I mean, it's obviously away from the coast, so it's not gonna have the problems of Jakarta of a sinking coastline, but do they know about water availability? Is it subject to flooding and landslides or is it subject to drought and wildfires? Do they know yeah. that? Because that's yeah. an environmental risk and any investor needs to know that. And there wasn't an answer forthcoming. And I think with such an investment like that, that's what the community, which, you know, in the business community, investors, they need to know that their investment is environmentally sure. And that's what scientists can now start to think about. You know, we're working with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, looking at their investments, saying which are the ones that are more susceptible to others. Yeah. Uh, ben, aside from... Uh, uh, 
from awareness, raising awareness in Singapore with your expedition to Antarctica. What practical uh, pieces of information, of science, do you expect to be able to contribute to the body of knowledge on ice sheet melt or climate change as it relates to Antarctica when all is said and done and you're able to parse the data and the information and the experiments that you've done? What are you, what are you hoping to add to this discussion? Well, ultimately, our objective is to put, produce the most accurate projections of future sea level for the cities of Southeast Asia. That's mm. what we're funded by the Singaporean government to do for Got Singapore it. and our neighboring countries. And that involves understanding the ice sheets. That involves mm. understanding what the oceans are doing. And it's also trying to understand what the land is doing because sea level rise is not what's happening in the oceans, but also what's happening in the land. And when you talk about young scientists, okay, so the ice sheets, Singapore's involvement in understanding Antarctica and Greenland is going to be minimal. It's driven by NASA, the European Union. They fly the big satellites and these very, very innovative ones. The oceans is a global collective. Um, Singapore doesn't have really a center of oceanography, so it's really driven by a lot of the other countries. And so, but then on land level, land level, you would think there was some United Nations consortium discussing how the land sinks or rises, okay? Because if the land sinks, and the land can sink, for example, in Manila, Manila the land is sinking because we are withdrawing fresh water out of an aquifer underneath the city, the aquifer shrinks, the land subsides, okay? So to understand it is quite complicated. The person who discovered the rates of sinking of the 50 largest cities on our planet was a 24-year-old Singaporean called Cheryl Tay. Hmm. Not Wonderful. NASA, not USGS, not the European Union, not Ames in Australia, not a big, you know, not a consortium of universities. One woman. Fantastic. One brilliant young scientist, and that's the future. Now we're armed with this data. We've got maps of all the 50 largest cities, and we identify not only the city that's the hotspot, the part of the city that's the hotspot. And mm. then governments and municipalities can direct their limited resources to protect those regions and those people. And without Cheryl's work, she led it on the back of a variety of young scientists based at EOS. We now have that data. That's and that's just I mean. wonderful. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. Mm. Just wonderful. Christine, I mean, final word to you then. You're working with these wonderful young scientists where are you taking them next? What's next for you <laughs> and these wonderful young scientists that's going to leave this show and now no. plan it with a bit of hope? And, and can you yeah. do a road show around Singapore <laughs> and around the region with this, you know, handful of great scientists that Ben's been working And with? let's bring them in wow. here. And, you what know, a get great question, guys. I mean, obviously, I'm on a mission. You know, there's so much work to be done, but there's also a lot of hope. You know, and as Ben said, there's so many brilliant young scientists and, and, and future scientists, children who are watching and listening uh, and are watching all our actions. So I'm very hopeful about the future. We just have to, as we said, you know, reduce emissions and make them peak by 2030, as Ben said. You know, so there is hope and we have to fire on all cylinders. Science is an integral part of that. But also, you know, working and protecting, you know, the more vulnerable because the, the ones who are least responsible for climate change will actually suffer the most from that. So a lot of my work is focusing on that, on building, building climate resiliency of, of poor communities in Asia in particular. But the young people are the future and we need to inspire them because there's so much brilliance and creativity in those young people. I have four children, you know, it's their future I'm, I'm fighting for as well. Um, so I am hopeful. Um, I think there is a lot more um, research that needs to be done that can then inform uh, governments and, and corporations to put their funds and, and capacity towards making sure that people stay safe. Um, and there is much more that we can do to reduce, um, you know, the way we're, we're, we're extracting from the world. And so all of us, I think the key message for today is, as, as we all both said, let's all be climate activists. Let's find ways to, to come up with solutions and let's, let's get those governments and corporations to, to be accountable for what they're doing, what they're putting out there in nature. Fantastic. Well, Speaking that's our great. language hey, now. Ben, you got to keep her close to you. She, she's the one that's uh, <laughs> put framing this the right way for us, right? <laughs> you give us all the great data, and she gives us that 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 message of, of how we can all move forward together. And I, and we, we just thank you both so much for being with us, and, and congratulations on this successful expedition. I mean, truly, truly historic for Singapore. 
uh, and for all the great uh, work you. that you've you've done there, and, and hopefully the great uh, insights and that we'll be getting in days. Coming to our, the launch of our documentary, I hope. And and we'll Let definitely have you back that. on. Yeah. We'll definitely have you back. And I'd on love for to that. have Christine on again with some of these young scientists. Let's have them on in the studio at some oh, point. And, yeah. uh, and Cheryl, right? Was it Cheryl Tay? Yeah. So uh, Cheryl, Cheryl worked on satellite-based information, and then we had hmm. Bang Yi, that who was the first Singaporean to set foot on Singapore. I uh, set foot on Antarctica as a scientist. And, and just to get back to one point, yeah, it's that message that inspires the future generation. Of course. Future generation, you know, young boys and girls who just see what Fang Yi was able to accomplish. I mean, that's mm. the thing that changes your life, yeah? yeah mm. Absolutely. See a pathway. Tan, Tan Fang Yi, who's a, a PhD student. At, She's a brilliant uh, scientist. You. you have to have her on, guys. You're going to yeah, love will. her. Yeah, yeah, we, we, will, we will definitely do that. Uh, ben Horton, Director of the Earth Observatory. Christine Amour-Lavar, Founder and CEO of Her Planet Earth and Women on a Mission. Thanks to you both for being on today. We look forward to having you on again soon. Thank uh, you have so a great much, weekend. guys. Lovely to chat. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ben. Bye-bye.